Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to God's house this morning at, at St. Paul's. We're uh, glad to be together on this sixth Sunday of Easter to celebrate uh, the continual presence of Jesus in our midst and what it means for us. And today we're going to focus in on the theme, the power of love. And Jesus continues to teach in John 15 uh, and gives the most common command in the Bible, love one another as I have loved you. Um, and the theme that's going to, uh, as I said, that's the theme that's going to drive our service. So we look forward to sharing that. We also um, have one brief announcement I want to share that in two, uh, three weeks, um, May 26th, the last Sunday in May, we're going to go back to our summer schedule, 9 o'clock, just the one service uh, at 9 o'clock. And we'll share that more um, as we get closer to that date. That is it for those kind of announcements. Uh, just one thing I want to note before we begin with the Easter greetings that as soon as we share those, we're going to sing our opening hymn, This Joyful Easter Tide. It's number 482 in the hymnal. If it's a hymn tune that you're not real familiar with, um, it's one that having the music before you is really helpful. So I would encourage you, if you don't know the tune uh, really well, to have the hymn book open to 482, um, especially in the refrain. Uh, it's beautiful and it goes quick, but there's long drawn out notes on the same words or syllables, and it's just good to have that music before you. And with that, we share our Easter greetings. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And this is how we know what this is how we know we love the children of God. Christ is risen.
invite you to stand as we call on God's name, a loving, a loving name that he puts on us in our baptism with the promise that we're his. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And if we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are righteous and Lord of We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by all we have done, and by all we have done in our We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your blessing and eternal punishment. Upon your confession, I do have good news for you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only son, Jesus, to die for you and for his sake. God forgives you all your sins. As pastor, it's my joy then to announce that grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of Jesus, to forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. And you may be seated for the word. The first reading for this sixth Sunday of Easter is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. So it's an extensive chapter that begins with uh, a vision that a man by the name of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, has of an angel that says he should go and find Peter. And so he sends his servants to go and find Peter. Uh, and while Peter is, um, while that's going on, Peter himself has a vision. And he has this vision where he sees a sheep coming down from heaven with all the foods of the Old Testament and animals that were unclean. And it says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter keeps saying, no, Lord, I, I, don't, un I don't eat unclean food. And then he begins to realize when the visitors come, as he goes to Cornelius' house, this was not about food, it was about people. And this is the encounter then that Peter has when he arrives to the home of Cornelius. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that was sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on the tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all prophets bear witness, and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. And our epistle today is from John's letter to continued reading that we've been sharing through this Easter season today from chapter five. John writes, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For where there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. And this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. <laughs> John from the 15th chapter. 
And this is a continued reading from last week in John 15. Jesus is in the upper room the night of his betrayal, the night that he washes his disciples' feet, and has an extensive time of teaching. And Jesus said to them, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have been made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the Gospel of our Lord. And you may be seated. And I'd like to invite the kids to come and join me for our kids' tour. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. You guys can sit down. And I'm going to show you some pictures. Hi. Come on up. Scoot up a little floor. We've got some more friends right behind you. Good morning. Oh, Y'all are doing great. Good morning. You want to sit up here with me? Maybe not yet. Yeah, come on, guys. All right. So you know what? You heard me read today from God's Word, and there was a word, a four-letter word that I kept saying a lot, and it has a symbol of this. What is that a, a symbol of? When people put their hands together like that. Say it if you know it. That's a heart, yeah. I, I'm not very good at that. I can never get it right. But I see a lot of people on TV do it, where they put their hands like that and they try to make the heart shape. And, and so they made that heart shape. And it always says love, right? I love. So what are some things that you say you love? Yeah, I can't either do it. So what do you say that you um, love? What are some things? Yeah, what's one thing? You, you love God, excellent. What about you? You love Jesus, okay, what about you? Like if I said, Eva, what's the one thing that you love the most? Family. I love my family. How about you? Mom. How about anybody? What kind of fruits do you say you love? Yeah. Grapes. I love grapes. I love apples. I love... What about things you like to do? Yeah. Play soccer. I love playing soccer. Football. I love kickball. Uh, so all these things we say we love. We love our family. We love God. We love food. We love doing things. We use that word love all the time. People use it all the time. You know that? People are always using the word love. And sometimes when you use a word so often, it just kind of becomes ho-hum. And you know, really, when it comes to love, I, I hope I mean something different when I say I love God and I love grapes. Don't you? I mean, I, there it is, but we just kind of use that word all the time. Now, John wrote a letter, and he said, this is what real love looks like. There is the shape of that heart again, but what's in the very center of it? What is say it if you know it. The cross, that's right, the cross of Jesus. He says, that's real love. Not that we loved, but that God loved us and gave his only son, Jesus, to cover all of our sins. That's what real love is. And it's not a feeling. It was all about an action. And then you heard Jesus give us that one teaching, and he said, and here's what you do to love. You love one another as I loved you. And you know what that means, to love one another? It just doesn't mean to feel. It means to do something. I like to say love takes action. And take a look. Love takes action. There's some pictures. Do you know who that lady is? 
She's a really famous lady from history. Her name was Mother Teresa. And she's holding and hugging a bunch of children who had nothing. And she loved them. She would give them food, give them a place to live. And then there's a person doing that. What is that person doing? A young girl. Who is she holding hands with? A grandma. Or maybe just some elderly person in the home. And she loves her. What's, what's happening in that one? What are people doing with feet? Yeah, somebody's washing somebody else's feet. Jesus did that. What about that one? What is that guy holding? Bags of what, do you think? Grocery bags. Yeah, food drive. And he's bringing all the food for people. And then people who are painting somebody's house because they couldn't do it themselves. That's what love is. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. You keep loving each other. It takes action. It's not just a feeling. It's about a doing. Because that's what God did for us. He loved us that much. He sacrificed everything that we would be his own. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a moment, about how Jesus loves and about how we are to love. And, and we're going to wear out that word love by not just saying it, but by doing. Doing for others as God has done for us. So let's pray to God. I'll repeat after me prayer. We're going to ask God to help us with that act of love. And we're going to ask the whole church to join us in this prayer. Dear Lord, Dear Lord you showed what real love is. You sent Jesus, sent Jesus to die for our sins, for our sins. That, we that we are free to now love each other yeah. and, help and help us to do, to do for, others, for others as you, as you have, done have done for us. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks y'all for coming up. And we're going to get ready to sing our hymn of the day. And I, I want you to open up your hymnal for this one as well, if you would, please. It's 556, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. Because um, there's something I want to point out about this hymn before we get ready to sing it. It's Luther's hymn. Uh, it's my favorite, actually, hymn that Martin Luther wrote. Um, and you can notice when you get it open there to 556, there are 10 verses. Yes, we are going to sing all 10 verses, but not all in a row. We're going to sing the first six before the message. We're going to end with the last, the last verses at the end of the service. But I want you to just take note of how this is, Luther lays out this hymn. The first verse, the first stanza, is just a hymn of praise about what God does for us. And then verses 2 and 3, Luther is writing in first person, and he's realizing that there's no way he could save himself. There's no way any of us could save ourselves. And then in verse 4, he says, but God's got a plan. Right, the good news of salvation that God does for us in Christ. And then in verse 5, Luther imagines that God is speaking to Jesus in heaven before he comes and saying, it's time. It's time to do the work of salvation. And Jesus will say, I'm ready. And verse eight, or verse 6 then, that's what happens. The son obeys. He comes and does the work of salvation. And that's where we're going to end before the message. At the very end of the service, we're going to sing stanzas 7 through 10. And when you take a note of those stanzas, it's, here's what Luther's imagining. He's imagining that Jesus is singing to us. Right? Verse 7. To me, he said, stay close to me. And then the rest of the stanzas are as if Jesus is singing this song to you. About what he wants from you now after he has saved you. What he is looking for you in your life as you walk with him. And that, that's a marvelous hymn, just a creative way of expressing our, our faith and our salvation. So please join together in singing, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice.
may the grace of God that has appeared to us in Jesus be the word again that uh, refreshes us and sustains us for our living in Christ. In his name, amen. The word that God has to direct and lead us today is that word from John 15. As Jesus said, my command I give, as I have loved you, so you love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Jerry Zucker, he is a director of a lot of major movies. Airplane was one of them. He was the commencement speaker, though, at UW-Madison 20 years ago. They invited him to be the commencement speaker. And in his speech, he offered the graduates five points. And it was the fifth point that caught my attention. Here, here was the fifth point of that commencement speech from Zucker. He said, do not overuse the word love. He said, everybody overuses the word love. I love your shoes, I love the new Justin Lake Timberlake CD, I really love those things that they put on the chicken sandwiches at Subway. Those were some of the examples he gave. He said, in Hollywood, people say, love you, babe, and so, okay, I get it. He said, that's just the way people talk, and it's probably harmless, but then he cautioned them, do not overuse the word love. Do not overuse the word love. In other words, don't wear it out. Well, maybe Jesus and John didn't get that memo. They didn't hear Zucker's speech. You, you look at the scriptures today, and Jesus, in his conversation from John 15, John, in the letter that he was writing, you cannot miss that word. They are all about love, 20 times. 20 times the word comes up, and a lot of the times the word is used twice in the same sentence. The theme is really easily understood. Love. But that word here in John 15 seems kind of out of place when you think about it, doesn't it? I mean, this is the last night of Jesus' life. It's going to be a night that was filled with pride and bickering among the twelve. There was hatred for Jesus. There was the betrayal of Jesus and his rejection. I mean, how does the word love fit into all of that? I mean, maybe Jesus and John have fallen into the trap of overusing the word love. I mean, how can there be love in such an unloving time and event? I mean, listen to Jesus' word again. He said to the disciples, my command is this, love each other, love one another as I have loved you. I mean, it's a simple enough command. It's not hard to figure out to love each other. But like Zucker observed, the, the word has become overused and worn out. I mean, I, I, I say I, I love I love oil shrimp. It's one of my favorite foods, and I love the Packers. I love the Packers, and I love fishing. And then Jesus comes along with his simple command, and says, "Hey, Mark, love one another." But because the word gets so worn out, it's easy for us to, in church, talk about the word love. But hasn't all that talk about love and all the different ways we use it just kind of worn the word, worn the word out? I mean, even in, here in God's family, in the church, we can find ourselves becoming full of pride. Oh, I know. doesn't seem possible, but yeah, it does. We become full of pride. And you know what that pride does? That pride drives love for each other away. And bickering. What? The disciples say they weren't the only ones who bickered. Bickering can be the hallmark of Jesus' followers today. There, there's an, epide an epidemic that is spreading across our land. I'm not talking about COVID. It's the epidemic of complaining. We who are simply commanded to love each other. How often do we find fault in the situations for the people that are around us? And we cannot stop ourselves from not being satisfied. And we try to drag others down with us with our non-stop complaining. How do you love somebody if all you're doing is complaining? Love each other, Jesus said. 
I mean, easy to say. But go out into the world, to a place where there is plenty of hatred. And, and some of that hatred comes from those who claim to follow Jesus. It's a hatred that's directed towards sinners, and, and it does happen. Now, I cannot fathom standing on street corners holding signs that protest the sin of others. While I fully affirm the sanctity of life, I, I am pro-life. I, I, I'm sanctity of life all the way. And, and I also affirm the divine purpose of sexuality, the marriage between one man and one woman, period. That's it. But the sins of abortion and homosexuality, you know what? They're not the only sins that God's against. But if you listen to the world, that's all they talk about. Jesus and the prophets actually had a whole lot more to say about greed, both corporate greed and individual greed, than the other sins that so many Christians with great zeal and hatred like to point out. Do not tolerate the sin, but love the sinner. Sometimes get lost by those who follow Jesus. And at the same time, our culture shows even more and more hatred for those who do follow Jesus. You know, that's the world. And it is against, it is against Christ and those who follow him. I mean, try to stand up and speak out for biblical truths in a very public setting. You ever try speaking the truth in love concerning how Jesus is the only way to salvation? He's it. That's it. There is no other way to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Try to do that. And you'll know the hatred of the world for those who follow Jesus. Love each other, Jesus said. Yeah, love each other. It's easy to mouth the words, but it is so difficult to actually put those words into practice. When friendships are so hard to keep, and so many relationships that we have are just fragile, to love each other, well, well, as long as that person is lovable, as long as that person says what I say and, and does what I do and think like I think, well then, yeah, I'll, I'll love them. We fear rejection. We know much of what we do and, and how we are makes us unlovable to God and certainly to others. You look at how many people are truly lonely. People just looking for acceptance, hoping to gain a sense of belonging, finding a place to be accepted and loved. It is one of the greatest needs for people in our age. So when Jesus says, love each other, it seems like a simple command that he gives. But when you look at it and when you think of it, how amazingly hard it is for any of us to love one another in the kind of world and the times that we're in. It's no wonder that Jerry Zucker advised those graduates of UW to not wear out and miss and overuse the word love. In Hollywood, he told them, people say, love you, babe, and they don't mean it. And then Zucker, com then Zucker commented, he said, it's just the way people talk, and it's probably harmless. And then he added this thought. He said, but you should not forget the real thing. The real thing he said is great. If you get it right, it will make you happier than anything else in life. Now, I'm not sure what kind of love Zucker meant 20 years ago what he had in mind in his comments in his speech about not forgetting the real thing with love and how it was so great and how by getting it right it will make you happier than anything in your life. I don't know what exactly he meant by that. But I do know that according to Jesus and what Jesus teaches, Zucker was actually completely right. Because this is real love, John writes. This is real love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the covering for our sins. That's real love. 
And so my command is this, Jesus said, love each other as I have loved you. And how did he love? With no limits. By washing feet. By in self-sacrifice giving away himself. This is real love. John was remembering what he had seen with Jesus, what he had heard from Jesus, what he witnessed Jesus do. And he said, that's real love. And I finally remember a time in my life I was eavesdropping on a conversation between my two youngest boys in the car. One day when we were driving them around, Bren was about five years old, I remember it. It was Easter time. Our family tradition was when the kids were younger, we, we would spend the entire Holy Week watching at night the movie Jesus of Nazareth. And, and they, the two were talking about the crucifixion scene. Brennan asked Mike, he says, well, why did Jesus die? And Micah responded, good theologian, to take away our sins and forgive us. To which Jesus, or which Brennan simply replied, oh, he said, oh, he loved us a lot. Yeah, he did. And that's the real thing. That is the real love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his own son to be the covering for our sins. And you know, that's the secret. And that is the power for our loving each other. It's in the, as I have loved you, part of Jesus' sentence. Get that right, Jesus said. Get that right, and my joy will be in you, and your joy will be complete. I mean, that sounds a lot like getting it right will make you happier than anything else in your life. Love each other, Jesus commanded. Love each other as I have loved you. And the power of that love isn't shown in just feelings. In fact, it's just the opposite. The power of that kind of love is shown in self-sacrifice. In a greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus said to the disciple, he says to you, and you are my friends. No greater love. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his life. And the reason, the reason he laid down his life, well, just take a look in the mirror. You are the reason. So that your sins would be covered. And now take a look at the person next to you. Gaze at the ones all around you. They are also the reason that Jesus laid down his life and calls us friends. And in response, you and I can do one thing. We can love one another as he loved us. My command is this, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus gave that command but if there's one thing in history that tells us for sure, is that you cannot legislate love. You can't make a law and say, you love. You can't do it, it doesn't work. But God, through Jesus, can command you to love. And discovering the difference between what the law cannot achieve and what Jesus can and does achieve for each of us, that is the great art of being a Christian. That in these words from Jesus, we are brought into the power of all his love. The command to love is given by the one who himself has done everything that love can possibly do for you. Jesus' command still stays the same. It's love one another. And, and the world says the same too. And the world is still the same. The world will be full of pride and bickering. The world will be full of betrayal and hatred and rejection. But we are the ones who change because we are Jesus' friends. We who are very unlovable have been loved by God, and that makes the difference. 
Because we are Jesus' friends, because we have been loved by him, because we have been given birth by God, what can we do? Keep Jesus' command. To love one another. And so remembering Zucker's advice to those graduates, let's not fall into the trap of wearing out the word love by overusing it with just our words. But rather, let's be about the command from Jesus to love each other as we've been loved by him. And as we're doing that, let's, let's wear out the word love, not with our saying, but let's wear out the word love with our actions, with what we do. Let's live out the command given by the one who has done everything in love for us. And let's wear out that word love today. And let's wear out that word love the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Wear it out. Not with words like, love you, babe, or I love pizza, but wear it out as a person loved by Jesus, who is a friend of Jesus, wear it out with love and compassionate actions for others. And never tire of doing it. The one who commands is the one who says, I love you. And then went out to lay down his life to save yours. And that's the power of love. As I have loved you, Jesus says, so love one another. Now you get that right. You get that right. And it will make you happier than anything else in life. Amen? And now may the peace of God that does transcend all understanding constantly guard your hearts, guard your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward uh, as they gather our gifts and our offerings that we bring before the Lord in our worship of Him. Jesus as tokens of the sacrifice of our lives to you. Use them, Lord, to build your loving word in our lives and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated, and I'd like to invite Lane to come forward. So in two weeks, we are celebrating confirmation, and our students have uh, worked at preparing their faith statements to share with you, and we welcome and invite Lane to do that today. and I go to Soul Jacka Middle School in Soul Jacka, where I live with my parents, my parent, with my four siblings, and three dogs. Some things I enjoy doing are sports, including track, basketball, and football, and I like training arms. 
I have come to realize that God has made me an interesting person with my traits and strengths. First of all, he's given me perseverance. As a student who's been involved in clubs, sports, catechism, and school at once, it puts a ton of stress and pressure on me to keep up. Last year, I had pages of pages worth of studying, weekly tests, catechism, and sports. I go from school to basketball, club volleyball, and want to get home until 10.30 p.m. on a school night. I was exhausted, but every night I'd still pray to my Lord for perseverance and to help me get through this time. Despite all these activities, I was still scoring A's on my test and ended up with 100% selective course grades for English, social studies, and my most challenging subject last year, science. Looking back at this period of time, I've come to realize that I have developed perseverance because of God. Not only has God given me the gift of perseverance, but also the gift of creativity. At a young age, I was always drawing and painting, and it was something I, I always enjoyed, something that came easy to me. My artworks were showcased in the art show, and by fifth grade, my artwork won first place for the combined middle school art show. Fast forward a year later, my art and art skills met the requirements to become the first gifted and talented student for art at the middle school. With that, my journey with art made me come to realization that God has given me a rare gift of creativity and art. And this is one of the reasons why I believe God is my creator and has created me. I believe that Jesus is my savior. I believe that he's my savior because of how willing he was to sacrifice my life, his life, for my sins. This specific action shows me just how much he genuinely loves me despite the sins I've done and will do. He could have made the painful process stop. He could have given up. Instead, he endured the pain and bore all the sins, including my own. I have so much gratitude for my Savior, knowing that I have received eternal life and will be able to live in heaven one day. To add on, the way Jesus lived in the Bible is a reason for how I should live a, a faithful life. He's also kept me from being with many others from being like many others in this world, confused, lost, and completely blinded by the devil's evil doings. The examples are the reason why I pray daily, give thanks, and attend worship often. In the end, I believe Jesus is my savior for dying on the cross for my sins, allowing me to receive eternal life. The Spirit brought me into worship through baptism because my parents are faithful believers who wanted me to become one as well. So on November 8th, 2009, I was baptized and all my family members from both sides were there, including my great my great grandmother in spirit. My sponsors were Lincoln, Ashley Lurkey, and Brandon Josie Schmoll. I believe the Holy Spirit will keep me in the faith by bringing me to worship as well as reading God's word through the Bible. My confirmation verse is Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. I picked this confirmation verse because of what's happening during this verse. Jesus is dying for my sins, enduring excruciating pain while calling to God, telling him to forgive us because we are lost sinners. This means so much to me because this verse shows just how much Jesus loves us and wants us to have eternal life. Since faithful people are like me, since people think faithful people like me will still lose their way from the light and go to the dark. Jesus still prayed to God to forgive us because we still get lost at times. Even if God knew to forgive us, Jesus still prayed to him to do so. I'd also like to point out that when the, state, the verse states the Roman soldiers casting lots to divide his garments, to me it portrays the idea that it didn't matter what was happening to Jesus in the moment or what the soldiers were doing to him. What really mattered to him was his purpose to die for our sins. And make sure that you've received your channel life. With that, I hope you I hope you all enjoy listening to my faith statement. And I expect to be confirmed soon. Thank you, Lainey. Would you just appreciate what you did? So it's not easy to uh, obviously speak in public, but to even share your faith is a harder thing to do, so we appreciate that. After worship, she'll be there in the back area to be greeted and just encourage her as she makes this next step in her faith life. With that, I invite you to stand as we pray to the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Eternal Father, we are so grateful that you are our strength and our song and our salvation and fulfilled your promises with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 
And you continue to give us that victory through him. And so we can say thanks be to God. May you lead and guide us then and empower us with your love to love one another as you have loved us. Lord, in your mercy. God, today we also cast before you the family and friends of Dorothy Winters, called home to be with her Savior. Lord, we pray that you would watch over them as they grieve and they mourn the death uh, that she had, but know also the hope of the resurrection, and who he promises whoever lives and believes in me, though they die, and yet shall they live. Lord, in your mercy. God, we also today want to pray for those in our midst who are hurting and suffering. We pray for all who have endured hardships and who are awaiting diagnosis or treatments who are overcoming uh, and recovering from surgeries. God, we pray boldly that you would bring healing and restoration to their lives according to your will. And we especially want to pray for those in our midst, for Nikki Brown and for Carla Keister as they continue to receive chemo treatment to drive disease from their bodies. Be also with Julie Miller, Lord, uh, she recovers from another treatment that she would, Lord, use those, have those treatments bring restoration and healing for, for her. We give you thanks, God, for a successful treatment this past week and pray that she would continue to walk in that way of recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, we pray for our land. May peace come upon it. May you root out all hatred and violence and seek people and have people seek your peace a peace that transcends all understanding, the only peace that can bring peace to our lives and the world that we live in. Lord, in your mercy. Now into your hands we commend ourselves and all whom we pray for as we trust in the mercy of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should give thanks to you at all times and in all ways. But chiefly are we bound to praise you, God, this day. For this is the day that you overcame death and the grave and have opened to us the way of everlasting life. And therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we together laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross now gathered in the remain the, the name of and the remembrance of Jesus we beg you Lord to forgive renew and strengthen us with your word and spirit grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament gather us together we pray from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you teach us to pray.
Jesus then on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do to remember me. And in the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood in the New Testament that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.
give thanks to the Lord. still far off. You met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, Jesus declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the way to everlasting life. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, and we who drink his cup bring that life to others. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through jesus christ our lord amen and now the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace amen and we sing the last verses of that luther hymn as if jesus is singing to us <laughs> 